The fastest growing of the 50 United States is Florida, where population increased by 79% during the 1950s. At a rate of 3,000 per week, new residents, attracted by a favorable climate and a rapidly expanding economy, are helping to make the Sunshine State a pace setter for the country's growth. A triple threat economy based on tourism, agriculture, and industry promises continued rapid growth in the present decade. In 1960 alone, 881 new plants were opened in Florida. Both residential and commercial construction were stimulated as a result. More of the same is forecast for the present decade. The state has built 500 miles of four-lane highways in the past five years, and a comparable pace is still being maintained. By 1970, superhighways will span the length and girth of the peninsula. From shuffleboard to citrus to missiles, on every front, Florida is on the move. Enrolls ever-increasing numbers of students each year. Recognizing that the state's universities would soon face an enrollment crisis, the Florida legislature in 1953 created the Council for the Study of Higher Education, to investigate and report on the state's needs in that area. The Council's subsequent report predicted Florida's colleges and universities could expect an enrollment increase of more than 300% by 1970. It recommended broad expansion of the state university system to prepare for the boom. With a need for expanded facilities now well established, Hillsborough County's delegation to the 1955 legislature successfully engineered passage of House Bill 1007, a statement of only three sentences. It said, the State Board of Education is hereby authorized to establish a state university or a branch of existing state university and to have a study made as to the feasibility of such action. The Board of Control and the State Board of Education are hereby authorized to enter into all contracts necessary to carry out the provisions of this act. With this bill, the foundation was laid for Florida's first new university in almost 75 years. During the next 18 months, the State Board of Control, which oversees operation of Florida State Universities, considered more than a dozen sites throughout the state as possible locations for the new institution. The Greater Tampa Chamber of Commerce, meanwhile, had organized a special committee on the university to promote its location in Hillsborough County. Finally, in December 1956, the Board of Control approved a site northeast of downtown Tampa. On December 18th, the State Board of Education, composed of the governor and members of his cabinet, passed a resolution accepting the proposed site. It called on the Board of Control to begin preparations for the university's opening in the fall of 1960. The first important decision concerning the university, its location, was accomplished. Now the massive job of development could begin. The approved site was in the heart of Florida's largest population center. Located 10 miles from downtown Tampa, the new campus had 1,700 acres, given to the state by Hillsborough County. The Board of Control chose as the university's first president, John S. Allen. Then, of Indiana, Dr. Allen had been at Gainesville since 1948 as vice president and acting president. Previously, he had taught at the University of Minnesota and Colgate University, and had directed the New York State Higher Education Division. Establishing headquarters in the Hillsborough County Courthouse in August 1957, Dr. Allen began the awesome task of turning an eight and a half million dollar appropriation and a handful of dreams into a full-blown university. He had just three years to prepare for the first class of students. Dr. Allen's first appointment to the staff was a librarian. Elliot Hardaway, assistant librarian at the University of Florida, joined the president in Tampa 
to begin the search for the vast array of volumes which would be so essential to the institution's success. As Dr. Allen entered into the planning of the university's physical plant, he had the services of a five-man board of Florida architects, named by the Board of Control to assist him in an advisory capacity. Visiting the University of Florida and other institutions around the state, Dr. Allen and the state architects inspected library facilities, classrooms, and laboratories. They observed many features which might be incorporated into the new campus design. With this experience, the architects entered into a contract with the Board of Control to design the first five buildings for the institution. In this way, it was possible for the buildings to have certain features in common. They would have a personality readily identifiable with the university, while at the same time retaining their overall individuality. Special effort was also made to design buildings which could be used for a variety of purposes the first few years. Later, they could be converted easily to their ultimate function when the need arose. By this time, the consulting designer for the campus had begun preliminary work on a basic campus plan. With the boundaries of the campus now determined, this plan was the first visual presentation of the institution to be created and also served as a guide for orderly development of the buildings in sequence. The early sketches were helpful in giving the legislature a broad impression of the scope of the university for which it was being asked to appropriate funds. Continuing their frequent meetings, Dr. Allen and the consulting designer eventually developed a comprehensive plan for the entire 1,700-acre campus. The plan featured buildings grouped according to use around the Central Mall, with streets and parking areas located along the periphery. With occasional modification, it would serve as a general guide for the wise use of the land. On October 22, 1957, the State Board of Education officially named the new institution the University of South Florida. To direct the academic program of the University of South Florida's four colleges, Dr. Allen attained the services of four outstanding deans. Dr. Jean A. Battle from Florida Southern College for the College of Education. Dr. Russell M. Cooper from the University of Minnesota for the College of Liberal Arts. Dr. Charles N. Milliken from Hardin-Simmons University for the College of Business Administration and Dr. Sidney J. French from Rollins College for the College of Basic Studies. These men undertook the initial planning of a broad educational philosophy, which was to become the nucleus of the eventual academic program. A dean of student affairs later joined the group. Dr. Allen and his staff were now located in headquarters downtown, and the pace of planning increased. The small group of University of South Florida administrators spent many evening hours explaining the project to high school classes and civic groups in the area. In all, they made more than 300 talks in the months leading up to the opening of school. By this time, architects' models of the first five buildings were being shown to the public. The University Center, the Administration Building, the library, the teaching auditorium theater, and the chemistry building served as vivid illustrations of what was to come. Dr. Allen continued his meetings with a group of architects to review final plans before construction was begun. On his permanent staff now were University Business Manager Robert L. Denner from the University of Florida and Clyde B. Hill, campus engineer, who assisted Dr. Allen in the non-academic aspects of the planning program. One of their first assignments was a visit to the campus site, overgrown with palmettos, stubby trees, and high weeds. Soon it would be converted into a small but thriving city of buildings, streets, parking areas, and people. Two years now remained before students and faculty would begin the traditional search for knowledge. On September 5, 1958, formal groundbreaking ceremonies brought a large crowd to the campus for their first glimpse into the university's future. 
Dignitaries of the county and state, headed by Governor Leroy Collins, reviewed the progress that had been made during the first years of planning. They also outlined the hopes of the new university, which was soon to become a reality. The turning of the first spades of earth by the governor and President Allen highlighted the ceremony. They were assisted by high school juniors who would be eligible for entrance into the first class. Another milestone in the university's creation had been recorded. The small shovels were soon replaced by giant earth movers, clearing the way for construction crews to follow. The process of creation was proceeding at an ever faster rate, and abstract ideas would soon become concrete realities. As the months passed, the university's administrative staff continued to expand. At daily planning sessions, they were confronted with an endless line of problems, ranging from selecting a faculty to choosing and purchasing equipment. Every detail, no matter how insignificant, required extra time and thought, for the university had no precedent to depend upon. Construction was slowed by bad weather in the winter of 1958. But during the following year, the administration building, the university center, and the chemistry building proceeded on schedule. A power plant was also under construction, and work was begun on the library and the theater. These buildings would form the nucleus of the physical plant. Dr. Allen and members of his staff visited the buildings frequently, discussing last minute details with the contractors and reviewing progress on the overall program. Later in the year, characteristic features of the buildings began to appear. Sandstone brick, white concrete columns, windowless walls on the east and west, and decorative concrete sunscreens gave each of the buildings identification. By the spring of 1960, palm trees were replacing palmetto clumps, and the administration building, first to be completed, was ready for occupancy. And now it was moving day from the Plant Avenue office and a grateful staff celebrated the long-awaited opportunity to abandon the temporary headquarters, which was now bulging with files and staff personnel. The final months before opening would now be spent on the campus. During August and early September, freshmen who would enter the first class were brought to the university in small groups for two-day orientation programs. They toured the campus, familiarizing themselves with each new building and with places that would, in later months, become campus favorites. The students also took extensive tests, the results of which would guide the faculty in advising and scheduling of classes. They also became acquainted with members of the administration and fact who were already on duty. In President Allen's greetings to each group of students, he defined a university as an organized opportunity for self-education. Each student was urged to join the community of scholars being assembled. You are the charter class, he said. What you do individually and collectively can set the tone of the University of South Florida for years to come. On September 26, 1960, the long-awaited dedication day was at hand. More than 7,000 persons, including 2,000 members of the charter class, gathered to honor the occasion. A distinguished faculty of 125 persons, 75% of them with doctor's degrees, was present in full academic regalia. Governor Leroy Collins, whose administration had spanned the university's development from drawing board to dedication, called it a day of joy. You, the faculty and students, have an unparalleled opportunity to pioneer new frontiers in education, he said. The faculty, carefully selected from institutions across the nation, looked on as J.J. Daniel, chairman of the Board of Control, placed a silver medallion replica of the university seal upon the shoulders of John Stuart Allen, formally installing him in the office of president of the University of South Florida. 
the institution was now officially in operation. Through the concerted efforts of literally hundreds of educators, public officials, and private citizens, the University of South Florida had become the first completely new state university to be built in the United States in the 20th century. If there are unique problems to be confronted in the creation of a new university, there are also unique advantages. While the absence of precedent may slow the pace of development, no outdated traditions will hinder careful selection of old and new ideas to be molded into the new institution. Here in these functional buildings, the stream of young students who are the lifeblood of a university had begun to flow. A student newspaper was started and student government, social and academic groups were formed. Classroom instruction was enhanced by a variety of new teaching techniques, from closed circuit television to tape recorded lectures in several rooms at the same time. In the library, the laboratories, and the lecture rooms, a new venture in higher education was underway. At the University of South Florida, the accent was on learning, and 2,000 freshmen, looking ahead to the first graduation ceremony in 1964, had already begun preparation for that day. Under the guidance of its first president, the university had begun to assume its responsibility in the search for truth, the dissemination of knowledge, and the building of new traditions. Dr. John S. Allen could look with pride at the University of South Florida, which stood as a tribute to far-sighted planning for the future by the citizens and servants of Florida. In the span of just five years, a university was born.